Hello. As our attendees continue to arrive, I'd like to call your attention to some upcoming programs on the slate. In a week, on April 28th, I'd like to invite you to a program preparing for and managing spring powder power outages. We'll talk about generators, battery backup systems, lighting, and food safety. Speaking of food, on May 12th, we're starting a new series. I'm gonna share my screen here so you can see what I'm talking about. So on May 12th, we're starting a new series called United Foods of America, which celebrates regional variations in some of our favorite food items. For our inaugural session, we're gonna take a close look at pizza across the country from New Haven style to deep dish and everything in between. On June 9th, we're offering a program on farmers markets and community supported agriculture options in the Chicago area. We'll give you the scoop on the best ones around. Finally, I'll just share a few administrative notes with you. The program is being recorded, so a link will be available on the Hinsdale Public Library website in a few days, which points to YouTube and the particular video. You can also, of course, search for Hinsdale Public Library on our on YouTube and you'll pull up all of our offerings that we've had over the months and years. In addition, I'm going to be emailing a copy of the slide deck to all registered attendees. So you don't have to feel like you have to diligently take notes on everything I'm saying because you'll have a copy of the slides. Um, in that same email, I'm going to be providing a link to a very short survey, which will allow you to give feedback on this program and maybe on some other programs you'd like to see in the future. Please take a moment to complete it when it arrives. It just takes a, a minute or two, literally. So if you have any questions throughout this program, please feel free to submit them um, via the chat feature or the Q&A button. Either one is fine. I'll definitely have time at the end of the program to answer these. So with all that said, I think we should go ahead and get started. Good evening and welcome to Cord Cutting 2022. My name is Mike Edding and I'll be sharing what I've learned about the vast variety of streaming services that are available to you nowadays. I personally cut the cord about 10 years ago. And while my experience has required some adjustment to the way that I watch TV, for the most part, I don't really miss it. Cord cutting is sort of a funny word. It refers to the process of getting rid of cable TV and replacing it with content streamed over the internet. Many of us have decided to ditch cable because of the all too frequent price increases. Others don't like being forced to buy tiers of channels, paying for several you don't want in order to get the ones you do want. Other, others of us don't like to be locked into uh, year long contracts, forced into watching um, a year of the same bundle of content just to watch a few months of a program that we're interested in. Whatever the reason people are stopping their cable subscriptions, the end result is that about, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, about a quarter of viewers in the US have left cable behind. Using streaming services is particularly popular among younger viewers like millennials and Generation Z, who've never really had their own cable bills. Uh, but it's also happening to older uh, watchers like Generation X and the baby boomers as they're uh, fed up for the same reasons that, uh, that many of us are. So I would say that cutting cord may not be the solution to all of your TV woes, but in my experience, making the switch is pretty satisfying. It's sort of like getting rid of an anchor that feels like it's dragging you down. So the first topic 
that I'd like to, excuse me, got to go back here. The first topic I'd like to discuss is live television. There are several companies out there who offer cable replacement products for those of you who like to watch TV on a schedule, uh, appointment viewing, if you will. Uh, there, there's a quick question. Um, someone is asking, um, they're trying to mute themselves, but they can't. Um, so yeah, the, the answer is yes, all of you are muted. This is the, the webinar format. So you don't have to worry about, um, about that particular problem. <laughs> so that's a good question. Thank you very much. Uh, so the best tool to figure out which live TV streaming service you might want to use, in my opinion, is one called suppose.tv. In suppose.tv, uh, you simply put in your location. So you can put in Chicago or the Chicago area and what TV channels you think you have to have. So in this example, I've put in Chicago and I've said I want something that has CBS. I want something that has TBS, and I want something that has BBC America. So then it goes into its database of all the options that are available to people for live streaming TV. And it's, it says, well, here is your best option. And here are some additional options you may want to consider. So for me, it's saying I should get the Sling Blue package and add the Paramount Plus premium bundle. And the total cost of that would be $44.99 per month. And it gives me 43 additional channels in addition to the ones that I've specified. And um, I think it probably has a link where you can actually subscribe. So I love Suppose TV. I used to spend a lot more time on picking the right live streaming service when I did programs like this, but Suppose TV came along and, and basically they've done all the work for you. So I highly recommend this service. You might try mybundle.tv as well. Uh, it's a similar item or a similar tool, um, but it just has a slightly different interface and you might prefer that one. So those two, I think are a great way to figure out which live TV services, if any, uh, might be right for you. Another qu frequent question that comes up is, how can I find the content I want to watch? What services are, are certain shows on or certain movies that I wanna watch on? So you might have a neighbor who you remember talking about Downton Abbey a few years ago, but you can't remember which streaming service she said she watched it on. You simply use a tool like justwatch.com and search for Downton Abbey. It will show you all of the streaming services where it's available. It will include um, things that you get for free as part of the streaming service and things that you can buy. So if I, if I really love Downton Abbey, I, I could go to Apple TV and purchase it. Or if I just want to watch it, I could go to Prime Video and uh, or Netflix or Peacock and stream it for free. So there are options there. I really like Just Watch. I use it all the time. Uh, if, if someone's coming into the library and asking, where can I watch a show? Um, I don't think you guys have it on DVD. It may not be available. I use Just Watch and I pull it up and it will tell me exactly where this particular movie or TV show is. Um, I understand that there's a service called uh, realgood.com that is also a good um, a choice as an alternative to justwatch.com. So give Real Good a try as well. You might find you like the interface better. Another question that I get is what kind of streaming device should I use? So I always answer, you should use a standalone 
streaming device rather than using the smart TV aspect of your television. So why, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just use something that's built in? It's convenient. It's probably got, um, maybe even has buttons on your remote that go directly to Netflix or Hulu or what have you. Why on earth would you use a separate device? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> Standalone streaming devices have better hardware in them. The processor that's inside these is more powerful. And how that translates into the real world is the interface will feel much more responsive and uh, snappy for the lack of a better word. There's no more pressing a button and, a button and waiting half a second for something to happen on the screen. It's, it's more or less instantaneous. The improved hardware in these streaming devices as opposed to smart TVs may also give you better sound options, allowing you to more integrate the sound from your streaming service into maybe your home theater system, if you have one. You can get uh, Dolby Digital, you can get DTS sound sometimes. You may even be able to get Dolby Atmos sound. So um, I think the improved hardware in general is a makes it a good reason to choose one of these standalone devices versus the smart TV. I would also say that these standalone devices get updates to applications and maybe to the, the Roku um, internal system of navigation. You might get a, an improved version of that while you might have to wait for that on your smart TV. And keep in mind, even if you have a smart TV, I would, this is what I do. I, I skip the smart, the smart TV part altogether and I plug in an external device, even though I could use the smart features, I, I don't choose to for the reasons that I've been sharing with you. Uh, so quicker updates. The third thing that you might consider is you can take a streaming device like this with you on vacation or to a second home. Many hotel rooms do have some sort of streaming provision where maybe you can enter your, your account information for Netflix and your password and get into it. But I'd rather rely on the sure thing that I have by bringing my own device with me um, and connecting it into the HDMI port of the TV. So when I travel, I do that if I'm interested in, in spending any time in the hotel room at all. So of course, all of this comes down to which one should you get if you're gonna get an external one. They're not, I mean, there are many options out there. They're not all the same. Um, many people, experts in the field seem to recommend the Roku boxes, like the Roku Streaming Stick 4K is a very popular option. Uh, it provides good performance, it provides high resolution with that 4K streaming capability, and it's only $50. So really you can't go wrong with the Roku Streaming Stick 4K. There's also a Streaming Stick 4K Plus, which I think has more functionality in the remote, but this $50 model I think is great. Um, I've used Roku units over the years with good success. I think they're solid products and they represent a good value. Saying that, I've, I've also moved on from Roku to Apple TV. Now, I have a lot of Apple stuff in my home. I've got, I've got computers, I've got an iPhone, I've got iPads. So all that works really well together. So I get those benefits that you have by staying in the same ecosystem. I also like the quality of the image that I'm getting over my Apple TV 4K and uh, the sound quality is excellent. It all just works very well together. And I find that the interface on the Apple TV product is pretty polished, especially now that they've replaced the remote with this silver one that you see on the screen. The one previous to this was black and had a larger multifunction sort of touch screen for, for lack of a better phrase. And it, it didn't work very well. It was, it was easy to click on the wrong thing, but this is a, a big improvement. It's, 
a premium product though. It's $180 unless you can find it on sale somewhere. And that's just the starting point. So if you're not tied into the Apple ecosystem by having their other products, I'd say get the Roku, uh, the streaming stick 4K. I should say I've also owned Amazon Fire TV devices and those have been fine. Like you can't go wrong with any of these really, but Roku and Apple, I think have a, a really good um, interface that, that works quite well. So for the big part of today's program, I'm going to talk about on-demand streaming services. And by on-demand, I mean, these are the ones where you open the services interface and you select something to watch from a large variety of shows or movies. The content is instantly available to you. It doesn't require that you watch at any specific time and date, it's just there. So that kind of, when you shift from kind of appointment viewing to this on-demand viewing, it's a, a big shift in the way you think and it, it'll change your viewing habits in many cases. I, I also want to know that uh, to note that when it comes to pricing, I'm giving price information on the ad-free options where they exist. So I can compare kind of apples to apples. And in my case, years of watching Netflix with no advertisements has sort of conditioned me to expect that. So I, I'm thinking in, in terms of a streaming service ought to have an ad-free tier. And that's kind of what I'm using as the basis for comparison. There are services like Hulu um, and others which have a lower tier that is ad supported and you can save some money that way for sure. So some people may find um, ads are fine. They give them an opportunity to get up and uh, get a snack or use the washroom or something. Um, so check the individual websites for these streaming services to see what are ad supported and how much cheaper it can be if you do that. So all that said, the group that I'm gonna talk about first is, are, are, they're some of the most popular streaming services and I've lumped them all together under the, the heading, the big names. And more often than not, if a friend tells you about a cool new show that you should watch on a streaming service, it's gonna be on one of these that I mentioned. The first one, that falls into this heading is Netflix. It's the first stop for many people on their streaming journey. And quite frankly, it may be all that you ever need. Uh, in the early days, Netflix was focused on offering movies to their streaming customers who were choosing this over the, their older DVD by mail program that you may remember. Over time, Netflix has shifted their attention from from this sort of uh, these mo movies and maybe some TV programs that other companies have made to original programming. This all started back with the political drama House of Cards back in 2013, if you can believe that. And it's steadily ramped up ever since. And it's included more recently gems like Stranger Things, Master of None, The Crown, their productions often have a premium TV feel with high budgets and notable actors. Uh, even more recently, you'll find shows that have become very popular like Bridgerton, Squid Game, Queen's Gambit, and The Tiger King. They've all achieved great popularity on Netflix. And I think you'll probably be able to find something you enjoy watching on this service. On the downside though, Netflix has shown a willingness to regularly raise their prices. The standard plan now costs $15.50 per month for HD quality and even more for 4K quality. In fact, Netflix stock took a big, um, or <laughs> took a big drop this week of 25 or 30% because they lost subscribers for the first time in over 10 years, in fact. I personally attribute this to their price increases that they've uh, been foisting upon their customers. And I think 
many customers have said, you know, enough's enough. I've been watching your service for years, but this latest price increase to fifteen forty nine is too much. Uh, they say, though, that it's because of password sharing. If you have an account, you might share it with your daughter in college, and Netflix views this as lost revenue. That that second account should be a paid account, and uh, that's that's where they're lying the blame largely. I think it'll be interesting to see if when they release the next price increase, how far their, their subscribers drop again, uh, if at all. People may simply move on if the prices get too high. And I'm sort of in that camp. I, I like it, but I don't know if I like it that much compared to some of the other options that are available to me. So if they raise the price to $20, I think I'm, I'm gone. But for now, it still is a reasonable price to pay for me. The next option that I'll mention is Amazon Prime Video. It's really an easy service to recommend to many online shoppers because it comes bundled with Amazon's expedited shipping service, which they call Amazon Prime. In my estimation, the, the selection of content here is not as strong as Netflix's, but there are certainly some excellent shows available. I think most notably of these is probably the marvelous Mrs. Maisel about a female stand-up comedian breaking the, the gender barrier in stand-up comedy in the late 50s and the early 60s. It's really funny and its costumes really capture the spirit of the time. You can also find the action show Reacher based on Lee Child's novels and the epic science fiction program, The Expanse. Amazon Prime also has tons of nonfiction content as well, making it a pretty well-rounded service. Amazon Prime, I should note, also allows you to, to do add-ons to their service. Uh, so you can add like BritBox or maybe Acorn TV to the Amazon Prime service that you already have. So you only have to go to one interface to see all your programming. The next service I'll mention is Hulu, which is a little different. It was formed as a way for several television companies to get their content online using this standardized interface. It features television programs from ABC, NBC, and FX, as well as Hulu Originals. Typically, Episodes of current shows will appear on Hulu the day after they air on live TV. In addition to this fresh content, you can find season after season of familiar TV shows, making it a great choice, a great choice for, for binging popular shows like Survivor and Castle and Frasier. I love, I really love Hulu. I've been subscribing for several years now, but the the landscape does seem to be changing a little bit. Some shows are going to be leaving in the future to be featured on their own streaming services. I'll give you a, a concrete example. So NBC has long had its content on Hulu, but they're pulling some of these shows and putting them instead on Peacock, on their Peacock streaming service. So, in the near future, Chicago Fire, Chicago Med, Chicago PD, those are all going to be leaving Hulu for Peacock. And I watch those shows, so that kind of bums me out. Um, I anticipate more of this sort of thing, unfortunately. So Hulu's value, I think, over time may drop a little bit if you're relying on it for some of those network programs. But they do have good program pr programming of their own. So The Handmaid's Tale was a major hit for them. I also like Atlanta. I like Rami. They've had a, a show called Pam and Tommy about uh, Pamela Anderson and Tommy Lee, uh, Motley Crue, their relationship is sort of turbulent. And there's a, a program called Dave that I think is really funny. It's about a, a rapper um, and his, <laughs> his strange life. So there's good stuff on Hulu by itself, but do I want to spend $13 a month on it unless I'm getting some of those familiar shows that I want to watch? You know, I'm not, I'm not sure if I will. 
in my opinion, the very best TV program or TV streaming service, I should say, is HBO Max. It launched a couple years ago, so it's a relatively recent innovation. And when it comes to prestige TV, I think there's no bigger, bigger name or better name than HBO. They bring their sizable catalog of original programming to the HBO Max service. You'll get legendary original TV shows like The Wire and Game of Thrones. You'll find those on the service. You'll find more recent options like Succession and the brilliant short series Chernobyl. You'll find Barry here, White Lotus. There's a, a lot of great stuff like that. They also, in order to make a bigger splash when they launched, they acquired the rights to Friends and the Big Bang Theory prior to launching in order to, um, to really kind of enhance their content. They also have content from C the CW, CNN, TBS, TNT, and True TV. It's not all about television though. HBO Max has movies from Sony Pictures. They've got movies from Turner Classic, Warner Brothers, New Line Cinema, and many other studios. And during COVID, they were releasing their, uh, pro their movies, their big splash movies on the same day on the streaming service as they were in the theaters, which was a really nice benefit. They're kind of scaling back on that nowadays, but as things are returning to normal, but it was a really cool feature while it lasted. So all of this taken together is a potent combination, I think. It's, it's a really good value, even though it is $15 a month, which seems high to me, but not for the quality you're getting here. Disney Plus is another one that's uh, relatively new. It launched in the US in 2019. It's of course well known for its back catalog of Disney movies and it has the Pixar movies as well, which are real crowd pleasers, of course. Disney Network shows are here as well. But in addition to this sort of kid content, there's a fair amount here for adults as well. Especially if you like Marvel superhero sort of movies and uh, the Star Wars universe. So Disney Plus is augmenting movies from these franchises with original TV content. So for the Star Wars universe, you've got The Mandalorian and The Book of Boba Fett. And Marvel, Marvel's universe has shows like WandaVision and Loki. Personally, I've sort of started and stopped Disney a couple of times. I don't have kids, uh, so you know I'm mainly focused on that adult content, which maybe is a little light now, but it's growing. So I'm optimistic. At, at the moment, I'm subscribing to it. But the great thing about cable uh, replacement services like these streaming services is you can you can stop your subscription at any time and restart it. So you can wait till there's a, a new TV program on Disney Plus you want to watch, then watch it all in a month, cancel your subscription, restart it up again in four months when the next new thing comes out. So that's one way you can save money and not be tied down to these long-term contracts that cable companies had. The next big name I'll mention is Apple TV Plus. Like Disney Plus, it launched in 2019. So they don't have a really strong track record like Netflix, and they don't have a lot of back catalog of content like HBO Max. But they've priced it pretty low, correspondingly low, I would say, at $5 a month. So you may have heard that a movie called Coda won the Best Picture Award at the Academy Awards this year. This was an Apple TV Plus film, and it was really, really good. If you haven't watched it, I encourage you to do so. You'll also find things like the funny and really feel-good TV program Ted Lasso here with Jason Sudeikis, and the Tom Hanks World War II submarine film, which went directly to Apple TV, called Greyhound. 
If you like Will Ferrell and Paul Rudd, you could try The Shrink Next Door, which is kind of a dark comedy. There, uh, Apple TV had this much hyped launch title called The Morning Show with Reese Witherspoon and Jennifer Aniston, which is also worth checking out, especially the first season. So there's, uh, there's a lot of good quality stuff here, but not as much as some of the other really big name streaming services. I think it's a decent value. Uh, and I hope that they keep adding new and fresh content to make it continue to be worth the price. So the next category that I'll talk about features streaming content from the big TV networks, specifically from CBS and NBC. And interestingly, ABC does not really have its own fleshed out streaming services, service. They instead are relying on Hulu to deliver their content online. Uh, they might have a website where you can stream things, but it's not built up like some of the other ones. So the first one of these is Paramount Plus. If you enjoy content from CBS, you'll, you'll really like the Paramount Plus streaming service. One of my recent discoveries on this one is the fantastic Western series called 1883. It's about a wagon train from Texas to the Pacific Northwest. And it features Sam Elliott and real life couple Tim McGraw and Faith Hill. It's really great from beginning to end. It's a prequel of sorts to the television program Yellowstone, which strangely enough is not on Paramount Plus. It's on the Peacock Network. So this is where these streaming rights get really complicated. So apparently the Peacock Network has streaming rights to the first three seasons of Yellowstone. You know, maybe that'll change over time, but for now you'll have to use two different services to watch those two different programs. In addition to 1883, you'll find The Good Wife on Paramount Plus, as well as its follow-up series, which is still current called The Good Fight. Science fiction fans will like Star Trek Discovery and Picard. And you might also want to try this program called Evil, which it, like the plot line is there's this investigative team with a priest, kind of a techie guy, and a clinical psychologist who's a real skeptic. And they look into paranormal events. It's, it's very interestingly filmed and has some, some good plot twists. But it's not all TV here on Paramount Plus. Some of their movies include A Quiet Place, Breakfast at Tiffany's, Django Unchained, and Forrest Gump. I also like the fact that Paramount Plus offers a live feed of CBS, which is great for those of us who don't have great antenna reception at our location. What I don't really love about Paramount Plus is the pricing. $10 seems a little high to me, even though they have all that movie content in addition to CBS content. I kind of compare it to Disney, Disney Plus and Apple TV Plus and the value that you're getting from those versus Paramount Plus, and it just feels a little expensive to me. I do subscribe, though, and I don't plan to end my service anytime soon. Peacock is a very similar service to Paramount Plus, but for shows originating on NBC. You'll find classic comedies like The Office here, 30 Rock is here, newer shows like Girls 5 Eva and Yellowstone are here, as I mentioned before. You'll also find content from Universal, DreamWorks, and Focus Features as well. Movies include Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Apollo 13 and Field of Dreams and uh, The Big Lebowski. <laughs> I think Peacock has some good programming, but like, like Paramount Plus, I don't really like their $10 ad-free tier pricing. It's notable though, that they offer a completely free option called Peacock, which is an ad supported tier that doesn't have all of the content of their current shows, it doesn't have much back content, but it is kind of a way to get you in the door to see whether this kind of content is 
appealing to you and whether you might subscribe to a higher level plan like the $10 a month plan. Uh, so there's a question in the audience, can we use a streaming service without a smart TV? And, and yes, you absolutely can. Um, I suggest using a Roku device or an Apple TV device. A good Roku will cost about $50. The Apple TV device is 180, so it's quite a bit higher. But either one of those are gonna be great options for you. Thanks for that question. So the next category, I'm going to talk about is the, the kind of services that are focused on movies. There may be some episodic content on them, but really they're here to give you motion pictures. There's a question about uh, live sports and I will talk briefly about that later. And is the device hooking up to your internet service? So yes. All of these streaming services require an internet connection to work. That's how they get their content to you. So if you have a smart TV, you're gonna have to connect that in some way to your home network. If you have uh, a streaming device like an Apple TV or, or something like that, you might plug in a network cable to it or connect to it via Wi-Fi. That's how those typically work. Good questions, thank you. So the movie-centric services. The first one I'm going to mention is called the Criterion Channel. For those of you who are unaware, Criterion is virtually synonymous with high quality versions of critically acclaimed movies. If you were a classic movie collector in the first decade of this century, you would often seek out Criterion releases over other versions because they were restored to a higher level and you grew to count on their, their curation of, of movies. So you knew if it was on the Criterion collection of movies, it was going to be a standout, critically acclaimed movie. So things like The Third Man and The Passion of Joan of Arc were lovingly restored by Criterion and made available. Criterion streaming services our st streaming service that they offer now has that same high quality approach. You'll find great movies here like Kurosawa's Rashomon, Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. You'll find Errol Morris's groundbreaking documentary, The Thin Blue Line, Vim Vender's ethereal masterpiece about angels watching over Berlin called Wings of Desire. Those are all here. If you're not sure you want to spring for the $11 per month for the Criterion channel, you can find a few items from their collection in the library's streaming service called Canopy with a K. We'll talk more about Canopy in a few minutes. I do think it's maybe a little overpriced at $11 per month, especially when you compare it to what you can get for HBO Max. But if you like that carefully curated content, I think you it wouldn't be a bad solution at all to get the Criterion channel. Okay, so there's a question, what do I mean by the number of streams indicated in the description? So that becomes a big deal if you have um, TVs in multiple rooms in your home, you can stream the Criterion channel on three different places at once. So it might be, three different TVs in your home. You might have um, a spouse who is traveling and they can watch one of those three streams while, excuse me, the other two are at home. So that's what I mean. It's, it's the number of simultaneous streams that are available to you as a subscriber to these channels. That's an excellent question. So uh, there's also a question really quickly about how do you get DVR services? And a lot of the live TV service, live TV streaming services offer some sort of DVR capability. I know that it's particularly good on, I think YouTube TV has a really good DVR service. Others are not as good in that regard. You might have to do a free trial 
with these various services to see how well they perform in that way. Uh, but yeah, a lot of people when going leaving cable are worried about, will I be able to DVR shows? And in many cases you can, it's, if you have that live TV service, the on-demand content that I'm largely talking of or talking about here, it's a non-issue because like it's all already DVR'd for you. Good question though. All right. Oops. Yeah, I think we're, we're ready to move on to Sundance now, which is the next one in the movie selection. So Sundance now focuses more on independent movies and art house movies like Boy and the Squid and the Whale, Ida, things like that. Things that if you like offbeat films, you'll find those here on this service. Um, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, compared to like the Criterion channel, I think there's less content available on Sundance now. So I think you'd probably have to really be a fan of, of this kind of indie film. And if so, uh, you know, it could be a good value for you. But if it were me and I had to choose between Criterion and Sundance, I think my tastes would lie more with the Criterion channel. But it's, you know, it's still, it, it's still $7 a month. So that's not too expensive. You could get both. Not all streaming services that are streaming movies are geared towards the general audience. I just wanted to give you an example of one of those, and that's Shudder. <laughs> so Shudder is a scary movie only TV streaming service. You'll find a lot of classic films like The Evil Dead, Reanimators here, Carnival of Souls is here, Halloween is here, Nosferatu is here. So if that's your jam, you're gonna really like Shudder. For, for most people who want a more general streaming service, they'd pick something else, but there are people that just love horror movies. I mean, you could subscribe to this during the month of October. So you have Halloween covered, then get rid of it. And uh, that would work pretty well because they, they do have a good selection of horror movies. So I also wanted to have a general catch-all sort of category of content that started out in cable, but has moved to streaming services or is also available as a streaming service. A couple of ones that I'll talk about are Showtime and Stars. So Showtime is one of those series that started out as putting movies available uh, on their service for people to watch. And people love that. It was a, maybe a cheaper option to HBO or Cinemax. But over time, kind of like Netflix, they've shifted. They've decided to do a lot of original programming and they've really been successful. Uh, they have programs like Homeland on there, Ray Donovan, Dexter, The Tudors, and one that I've been watching recently called Billions which is just great. Um, with all this content, I, I think it's maybe a little pricey at $11 a month, but the good thing about Showtime in particular is throughout the year, I think they offer special deals on subscriptions to Showtime. And uh, I think they even bundle this. Uh, as I, I think I looked yesterday, and you can get a special deal that bundles Paramount Plus and Showtime together for a price of $12 a month. And that's, that's quite a good savings compared to the standalone prices for each of those. So $12 a month for both of those, I think that's, that's a great deal um, considering what you're getting with Paramount Plus uh, as an add-on to Showtime. So look around for deals, you can find them sometimes. Stars, as I mentioned, is another uh, premium cable channel that's made its way into a streaming service. It's the home of the great dramatic series from several years ago called Damages with Glenn Close. There are more recent offerings that are very popular like Heels, 
about uh, pro wrestling and black sales, but I think probably their most popular TV show is Outlander based on uh, the book series of the same name. For $9 a month, um, it's not too bad, I think, as a deal. It would be, uh, if you like Outlander in particular, it's the only place to get it, but uh, it, it seems like it stacks up reasonably well with Showtime, although I think Showtime releases more original content. So check out Stars, maybe. The next category, uh, we had a, a question earlier about this. What about sports? Well, sports is is the biggest challenge for streaming. And it's been that way from the very beginning. When I first stopped uh, using cable and started streaming, sports was a big deal back then. It was hard to get, and it continues to be a problem. There are services out there uh, that, that offer live sports. Uh, like ESPN Plus, for example, is one of those. ESPN Plus is not a replacement, though, for ESPN. It's not even a replacement for ESPN2. It's kind of like their third tier of sports programming. So you're not going to get the latest and greatest high-profile games on ESPN Plus. What you will get, though, is a great series of documentaries. If you haven't seen the OJ Made in America, documentary series, um, it's, it's fantastic. It looks at our society. It looks at how, how OJ came to be the, the figure that he has become, uh, how he was received in his college days. It's just a fascinating documentary series. The collection of documentaries that ESPN released called 30 for 30, which I believe has ballooned well beyond 30 films. Um, these are also really good. If you're into sports, these are well worth watching. We have a few of them here in our collection on DVD, but um, I think you could probably get most, if not all of them on ESPN+. Plus. But if you're a real sports fan, you're not necessarily going to, to find that this is sufficient to, um, to get you all the sports that you need. Although they do have a fair amount of soccer from what I understand. To do something that's more inclusive, you'd want to get something like Fubo TV, which is dedicated to sports. It's, um, it's got content from the NFL, from Major League Baseball, NHL, WWE, Premier League. It's got a lot of, of stuff available to you, but even their base package, which, uh, it's pretty expensive, like $70 a month, isn't probably going to give you everything that you want. So it's just really hard on, on live streaming to get sports fans exactly what they want. Oftentimes you can add like a season pass, like NFL game pass, MLB TV, NHL TV, and NBA league pass onto other streaming services. And then you could like watch the season of games. You'll get, you'll get everything theoretically, uh, except those that are blacked out for regional restrictions, but they, they cost a fair amount. Um, I guess you could look at it like you subscribed for a portion of the year, you get all that stuff. And then maybe you cancel your Fubo to, uh, for the rest of the year. So you don't, you're not spending all that 70 or $80 a month for uh, one season worth of sports. Uh, I'll tell you another trick that some people do to get around this regional restrictions thing. And that's to use a smart DNS service. So you'd add whatever MLB TV to your streaming service. And then you subscribe for about four or five dollars a month for something like Unlocator. And what this does is it fools the computer systems that are streaming to you into thinking that you're out of market. So if you want to watch your Chicago White Sox games with an MLB TV pass, 
you're not able to typically, but if you get this unlocator, you, it might think that you're in, uh, uh, you know, Rhode Island or something, and you're able to get around those restrictions. Now, now I'm not a lawyer, but um, this might be violating your terms of service if you do something like this. So investigate that on your own. But I just wanted to point this out. Uh, a sports fan that I talked to about streaming sports says that he uses this and it works really well for all the these uh, season passes that he tries. So something to consider. Um, just be aware of that, like the fine print to, to see if this is actually a violation and you can get in trouble for this through uh, the service that you're subscribing. But, you know, there's, there's no great solution to sports on streaming. And a lot of people will keep some vestige of cable TV just for sports and then add these streaming services on top of that. Uh, sports is by far the most expensive part that cable uh, services have to pay to get a channel. So something like um, ESPN is gonna cost them a lot of money, maybe eight times as much as another program. And they pass that cost along to you when you try to get a streaming service that has things like that. So yeah, as far as I know, there's not a great solution to the sports dilemma for streaming. I, I wish there were. I'm not an expert on streaming sports. I, I care mainly about college basketball. Um, but those of you who have suggestions for sports, you might share them in the chat functionality with your uh, other attendees to, to see if there are, are better choices. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is British TV. I can speak from experience that British TV series that we have on DVD are very popular with the public here in Hinsdale. So if you come in and you don't see your favorite TV show on DVD that's British, you might try one of these streaming services that I'm going to mention. The first one that I'll talk about is free with your Hinsdale library card, and it's called Hoopla. We haven't talked about Hoopla yet, but um, Hoopla you may be most familiar with as a way to get downloadable eBooks and e-audiobooks onto your like your iPhone or something and or your tablet to read them or listen to them. But Hoopla actually has a pretty good selection of British TV. You'll find shows like Ms. Fisher's Modern Murdering Mysteries. You'll find Doc Martin here. Top Gear is here. My Life is Murder is on this service. So a lot of these British shows that are on Hoopla are through an arrangement with um, Acorn TV, which I'll be talking about next. So if you want to try it out, try Hoopla, see what's available on there. And if you want the full Hoopla or the full Acorn TV experience, you'll want to subscribe to it. From what I understand, Acorn TV is really strong when it comes to like murder mysteries and that kind of content. The Murdoch mysteries are here, Midsummer Murders, Dalgleish, A Suitable Boy is not a, a murder mystery show, but uh, that seems to be their niche. They have an awful lot of that sort of content. And it's not just from Great Britain. You'll find there are other former colonies like Australia and New Zealand uh, represented here with television programming. One other thing that I'll mention, Acorn TV also has original programming that's not available anywhere else. So um, you might try Acorn TV. BritBox is the other big name in British programming. If you have um, a love for British television, but you're not so focused on the, the mysteries that they do so well, you might try BritBox. They cast a broader net than Acorn TV. They include long running drama series like Coronation Street, reality TV like Love Island. Uh, they have Black Adder, the, uh, <laughs> the fantastic comedy anthology series that uh, was several years old, but um, still holds up. I'd say uh, this at $7 a month break box really seems like a fair value. 
Acorn TV was about the same price as I recall. Each of those would be good depending on your interests. Oh, the, the fall with uh, Jillian Anderson and Jamie Dornan um, is another really good show that you can find on BritBox. The last category that I'll discuss is something that I like to call for the love of learning. One of the great things about cable TV, I think, is the broad variety of nonfiction programming that you can get. Fortunately, a lot of this content has made its way onto various streaming services. And this is where I get to talk about Canopy again. So Canopy with a K is free with your library card. And I mentioned before that they have a few Criterion Collection movies, but they also, and perhaps are more well known for their documentary films. You'll find standout films like McQueen about the late designer Alexander McQueen, I Am Not Your Negro about uh, the work of James Baldwin. You'll also find the Great College Courses collection here. Not all of the series in the Great Courses are available, but many of them are. Uh, the Skeptic's Guide to American History is one example. All in all, it's a free service to library cardholders. There's no downside to adding it. I think I have an Apple TV app that's available to me to watch Canopy movies. You just sign in with your library card information and, and it's free. So it's, it's really great. Oh, there's a question. Does BritBox have the Up series? I don't know. That's an excellent question. For those of you who don't know, uh, there's a series of documentary films released every, I think, seven years. Like there's seven up, 14 up, 21 up. And they all look at the lives of a group of people of various socioeconomic classes in England. And then they follow them every seven years to see what's new in their life. And it's, it's just a brilliant series. I don't know whether that is available you could go on justwatch.com and type in seven up and see what comes up. Um, I'm sure it's gotta be out there somewhere, but yeah, I do, <laughs> I do recommend that highly. I'm sure Maureen, uh, you've watched some of those and you enjoy them, they're, they're really great. The next service I'd like to talk about with nonfiction programming is PBS. The free PBS has a limited number of or limited amount of recent programming of this type available to you. But if you want complete access, you're going to want to get the PBS Passport. It costs $5 a month. And it's, I believe, considered a donation to our local PBS station, which is WTTW in Chicago. It's really a great bargain for people that like to learn throughout their lives. So for example, you can prepare for your next trip with Rick Steves Europe. You can learn to value your heirlooms with Antiques Roadshow. Learn how to cook with fantastic food programs like America's Test Kitchen and Cook's Country. And that's not even mentioning the great nonfiction programming you get like Nova and American Experience. Just a ton of content here. So by nearly any metric I can think of, uh, at $5 a month, PBS Passport is just a brilliant bargain for educational television. And it's not all nonfiction. Um, you'll have shows like Victoria, which is very popular, All Creatures Great and Small, which is very popular right now. So um, I highly do recommend the PBS pa Passport content. But as I've mentioned before, a lot of the content that we get that's nonfiction in nature comes from cable. It originated there. Discovery Plus is a really good example of this. For $7 a month, you can watch the great travel food show, No Reservation, starring the late Anthony Bourdain. You can find restaurants a little closer to home with diners, drive, <laughs> diners drive-ins, and dives, hosted by Guy Fieri. Uh, close to home, Del Rey's Chicken Basket and Chuck's Southern Comforts Cafe were featured on diners drive-ins and dives, among other Chicago area classics. So I, I like that show. 
Um, the show Myth Mythbusters is here, which uses science to test urban legends, like whether it's possible to fold a sheet of paper more than seven times, and whether a water heater can explode upward through a home going through the roof and into the atmosphere. They test these things out using science. There's plenty of nature programming here, of course, like Perfect Planet from BBC Earth and Animal Planet. Discovery Plus includes not just programming from the Discovery Channel, as you might expect, but also from TLC, A&E, HGTV, the Food Network, Lifetime, and more. So $7 actually feels like a pretty good value considering the breadth of material you get. Now, I will note that I've, I've read recently in the last month or so that HBO Max and Discovery Plus are going to be merged together in some fashion to create this super streaming service. So hopefully you get a discount compared to their individual prices. But you can imagine having the great prestige TV of HBO Max combined with all this familiar nonfiction programming from cable that you get through Discovery Plus. I think it'll be pretty good. If you're looking for a cheaper option, uh, Curiosity Stream is, is something that you should consider. I subscribed to Curiosity Stream for a year. I think I got a super special deal on Black Friday where I got a year for like, it's like $15 or something. But their normal price is $3 a month, which is not much at all. Um, I do encourage you to look around for, for better deals. Sometimes you can find them. It covers a wide gamut of nonfiction programming. One of my favorites that they offer is called Rock the Park, which gives an in-depth view of US national parks. You'll also find documentaries here like Super Size Me and Tower and more specialty programming like What's My Car Worth? If you're interested in sampling Curiosity Stream shows, once again, the library comes to the rescue. The Hoopla app that is free with your library card offers something called a binge pass. So you can check out a binge pass for Curiosity Stream. For seven days, you can watch all the Curiosity Stream that you want. And you can determine maybe based on that, whether it's worth subscribing for the $3 a month or maybe some special annual deal. So take a look at Curiosity Stream through, uh, through Hoopla to see if it's worth it. It might be. And the final nonfiction programming option with streaming that I'll talk about is called Magellan TV. It's $7 a month and offers thousands of hours of programming according to their literature. You'll find the beautifully shot from above travel series. You'll find um, true crime shows like Customs where agents try to stop smuggling rings. You'll find history series like Ancient Warriors. Personally, I think Discovery Plus offers a more compelling mix of content at this price point. But if you enjoy nonfiction shows, I think Magellan TV could be worth a try. So if we put all of this information together, I have a few picks that I particularly like. For someone new to streaming services, I think that this particular bundle would be a good general purpose bundle. You'll get prestige TV with HBO Max. You'll get comforting and familiar programming on Hulu. You'll find um, original programming from Netflix that they're always coming out with. PBS Passport at $5 a month is a steal. And then you supplement that with Hoopla and Canopy, which are free to you as library card holders. And, and you have a, a pretty good mix of sort of the fictional content and non-fictional content. This doesn't, of course, include the BritBox and the Acorn TV world of British TV, which you could add for not too much more. It doesn't include sports, which if you're gonna get into it in any serious way is gonna cost a lot more per month. But I think for a general purpose, 
streaming audience, it's, it's a pretty decent way to go. Um, so at this point, I'm going to open the floor up to questions. I think we have, um, we have questions about YouTube and the content there. So there are, it's a little confusing because there's two different YouTube services. There's the standard YouTube that comes with the internet that you can search for like, um, <laughs> how, how to, uh, I don't know, how to refinish furniture and you'll find 20 videos about people who refinish furniture or how to do your makeup. So that, that stuff is all on YouTube and it's free. Of course, you get those ads with it. And then you have the YouTube TV service, which offers numerous like traditional cable streaming channels that you could find there. So I haven't really spent any time with YouTube TV as a service, so I can't tell what it's like. If any of you who subscribe to YouTube TV might want to jump in and share your experiences in the chat function, um, I think that would be helpful for others. I, I can't give you a good idea, though, of what it includes and what it doesn't include. I do know that by reputation, they have maybe one of the best DVR features in the business. So if you're interested in a particular show, you can record all upcoming episodes of that show on YouTube TV and be very happy. Um, so that's, that's a really good question. Are there any other questions? You can use either the Q&A button or the, the chat button. Oh, you're welcome, Mary. Um, I'm glad you found that it was helpful. Uh, I, I tried my best. This is the, I think the third or fourth time that I've done a program like this. I try to do them every three or four years that things change so rapidly, it's hard to keep up. Um, prices have definitely gone up since I first started, which is disappointing, but not surprising. Are there any other questions? Well, if not, um, thank you very much for attend. Oh, here's a here's a question. Um, my daughter set up Netflix, and I'm having a hard time sifting through all the films and finding something to watch. So yeah, you know, I agree, Deborah. Um, Netflix is a little confusing. It they don't necessarily make it that easy to find what you want to watch. You have to often scroll through a bunch of categories, you know, like you might have a, a category that goes across the screen that's like um, Asian American and Pacific Islander films. And then you might find some that are thrillers, some that are comedy series. It's, it's not easy. They do have a, se a search function, I think, in their interface that you can look for specific things. But it, it's it's not the easiest service to browse around. I, I completely agree. A uh, question from Suzanne, how do we watch regular TV channels? And by regular, uh, I'm assuming you're meaning like the network TV, ABC, NBC, Fox, that sort of thing. And those you can get in a few different ways. A lot of these live TV service TV streaming services like YouTube TV, Sling TV, and there are many others. Uh, those have those local or the, the national feeds or the local feeds for your big network shows. Another option you might want to look into is getting an antenna for your TV. Uh, often you'll get really high quality, assuming your antenna is in a good place, maybe on your roof or in your attic or something you can get a really high quality feed of all of those network TV shows, even better than cable because it's not compressed. Yeah, right. Um, so that's what I would suggest, looking into some of those live TV services and, and go to that suppose.tv, say you wanna watch ABC, NBC, CBS, and see what your best options are as far as price goes for those things. That's a, that's a great question. I think a lot of people don't want to miss that major network content. 
is the hoopla and canopy that the library has the full collection of films that these streaming companies offer? Well, I don't think so. Um, so you might be able to get a taste for, you know, the Criterion collection, a few of their films, but you're not going to get the whole thing. Same with BritBox. You're not going to get all of the BritBox content. So, but it, it is a good way to, to see if you like it and then you could subscribe to the real thing. But yeah, that's, that's a good question. It would be nice if, if we got the, the whole full fat uh, TV <laughs> uh, programming through the library's options, but unfortunately not. Uh, are there any other questions? That, that was a good one. Uh, so can I repeat the sites for where to find movie? I'm assuming you're talking about where to find movies on streaming services. And uh, the one that I like to use the most is justwatch.com, but there's also realgood, R-E-E-L good.com. And uh, both of those will tell you where you can find any given movie or TV show on the internet. But that, that's... Yeah, that's a, a very common question. I get that asked all the time. And thank goodness those services exist. Otherwise it would be it would be impossible. Any other questions before we wrap it up tonight? So yeah, I know streaming is fairly complicated and especially if you haven't really jumped in full force, it can seem a little overwhelming. Hopefully this will help you to start to give shape to maybe what you're looking for, what's out there that you didn't know was available. And some of those services like Suppose TV to find what the best live service for you might be. I think those can be really helpful. Uh, cable news channels. Well, that, <laughs> that's, that's a little tough. Uh, CBS, not CBS, CNN tried to launch a service called CNN plus or something with CNN news plus or something. And they started it a month ago and they just shut it off or they're just, they had just announced that it's going to end today because it wasn't popular. Um, I think there, you have ways to get things like CN or CBS news. It's not the same thing as the news that you get from the real CBS, but it's, it's like an alternative I think Roku through through them you can get that channel. I think on Apple TV that might be available, but as far as like uh, I don't know other news sources like Fox News, I'm not sure. Um, I haven't really gone down that rabbit hole. I I read most of my news like on the internet rather than watching it live, so I, I don't know all the ins and outs of that. But that, that's a good question. Uh, if anybody has any thoughts on that, feel free to um, share those with Suzanne in the the chat button there. Well, um, I think that'll wrap it up for tonight. I thank you very much for participating. Again, I'm going to send out a copy of the slides to everybody who registered. And we will be posting um, a copy of this video up on YouTube in the next few days. It could be Monday before that goes up. So keep an eye on that. And thank you very much. If you, uh, if you want to chat with me at the Adult Services Desk, feel free to come in anytime that I'm here. I'm, I'm happy to do it. Yes, you, you can call Adult Services for more information. You can email us at as at hinsdalelibrary.info if you have questions. You can email me directly at m-o-e-t-t-i-n-g at hinsdalelibrary.info. But again, keep an eye on your emails that you use to register for the program. I'll send you the link to the slides and I'll send you like a, a little brief evaluation online form to fill out. So thanks very much, everybody. Uh, I appreciate your attendance. I hope you have a great night. Bye-bye. <laughs>